morning. I am Prof. Y.K. Chan, and I'll be chairing and moderating for the whole one-hour session today. Today, we actually bring you into a new realm of medicine, and that is planetary health. And we have two very special speakers who will present about the clinical practice and how they are realigning their impact or negative impact on climate change and environmental degradation. And being pediatric anesthesiologist and surgeon respectively, they are extending their advocacy for the young to align the world towards a better tomorrow for these patients when they grow up. And we're going to start off with our pediatric anesthesiologist, and that would be Prof. Ina. And I'm going to introduce her first because she's going to be speaking first. She actually was a graduate from the University of Dundee, Scotland, and she went on to do a Master of Anesthesiology from the University of Malaya. And after she graduated from there, she gained more expertise and experience in fellowship with the Pediatric Anesthesia Program from KK Women and Children's Hospital, as well as very specialized training position in um, transplant medicine from Shanghai in China. And she earned a master degree in medical education recently from the University of Malaya. She'll be attending the convocation, unfortunately, today, or congrats to her. And so she won't be with you in person, but would be doing her presentation by video that has been pre-taped for you. And currently, she serves as the president of the College of Anesthesiologists, being the ex-president or the past president of the Malaysian Society of Anesthesiologists. And she champions clinical excellence for patient safety and optimal outcomes through her leadership roles in these organizations. And of course, she's very passionate about planetary health, as you will see from her presentation. So we will have the tape recording of her presentation now. Assalamu alaikum and good morning, dear esteemed colleagues. I extend my sincere apologies for not being able to present live before all of you today. I will start at this breakfast at UM Health. Dedicated to sharing our passion for greener surgery was scheduled well in advance, coinciding with the invitation to attend my own convocation for the Masters in Medical Education at the Convocation Hall DTC this morning. Thus, I express my heartfelt gratitude to the faculty for affording me this invaluable opportunity to be part of this lecture, mm -hmm. even though I am unavailable to join you in person. In the next 20 minutes or so, I would like to go through this outline. Where are we today in terms of global warming and climate crisis? How did this happen? And what can we do to mitigate this process, particularly from an anesthesia point of view and on personal basis? In recent decades, the Earth's life supporting capacity dwindled due to the escalating pollution and habitat loss. This sparks climate crisis and global warming which led to the environment instability and increase in the disease burdens worldwide. How did this happen? Over the years, we contributed to global warming and climate crisis through our activities such as deforestation, destruction of marine ecosystem with the increased population, and last but not least, the greenhouse effect. As a result, the global surface temperature is 1.1 degrees Celsius higher than the pre-industrial levels and continues to rise at an unprecedented rate. We are warned that the increase in carbon emission has threatened to worsen global warming. The world temperature is expected to be close to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial era before the world first started to heavily use coal and gas as the source of energy. Recently, United Nations predict that this would happen in 2029 rather than 2030.
These climate changes increase our disease burden as it leads to many health problems as illustrated in this infographic. Among others, the polluted air exacerbates respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, extreme heat can lead to heat-related illness and cardiovascular failure, and the severe weather and flood lead to injuries and fatalities. Alarmingly, the healthcare sector emerged as a substantial contributor to this crisis. While healthcare sector aims to address human health issues, we also contribute significantly to environmental pollutions. 5% of total global greenhouse gas emission is attributed to the healthcare sector. We produce greenhouse gases directly from the use of electricity and medical gas and indirectly by the consumption of goods and services. As we know, perioperative care is a material, energy and water-intensive process that contributes to global carbon emission. Therefore, it is not surprising to note that operating data contributes 25% to all hospital waste and of which 25% arises from the anaesthetic care. How does anaesthesia contribute to these changes? The cost can be divided into general and specific reasons. In general, much of the environmental emissions generated by healthcare are indirect or embodied in the manufacturing of products and energy that supports healthcare facilities. Mm. This includes the procurement of medical equipment and drugs, the upstream greenhouse gas emissions, hospital energy consumption, and hospital waste production and its management. Specific causes are mainly contributed by patient. The foundation of understanding a product's environmental impact lies in the LCA methodology. This is crucial in gauging its effect on environment from creation to disposal, i.e. cradle to grave impact. This detailed approach looks into the drugs and equipment manufacturing, preparation of product and so forth. Therefore, applying life cycle analysis to procurement decisions in Malaysia healthcare sector is very important as it allows for informed choices based not only on a product's efficacy and cost but also in its environmental implication. The majority of greenhouse gas emissions are prevalent upstream in the supply chains of healthcare services particularly within hospital where pharmaceuticals and medical equipment are procured. Using life cycle assessment, the cradle to grave environmental footprint associated with natural resource extraction, manufacturing, packaging, transport, reuse and recyc recycling of waste disposal of products or processes were analyzed. The greenhouse gas emissions originate from various stages of this supply chain and they significantly contribute to the overall carbon footprint of healthcare institution. Carbon dioxide equivalent emission associated with energy use varies considerably internationally based on the predominant energy source. In Malaysia, our main energy source is still oil, followed by gas and coal in comparison to the European countries that utilizes renewables and nuclear energy. We know that obtaining a source of energy from renewable energy is cleaner than obtaining the energy required from coal. Therefore, we need to do better in our source of energy. Other factors that can contribute to the increase in carbon footprint of a hospital is the patient factor itself. The journey patients undertake before surgery involves several hospital visits for assessment, clinic appointments and numerous investigations. This will not just strain their time and finances but also contributes to the environmental impacts due to increased transportation. In addition, preparing patients for surgery often requires blood and radiological investigation. Thus, we need to coordinate the request for this investigation in order to avoid unnecessary investigation that will increase carbon footprint. Lastly, increased comorbids in patients may lead to longer hospital stay and increased use of resources. This too will translate to higher energy consumption 
greater waste generation and elevated emissions of greenhouse gases. Anesthesia contributes to the increase in greenhouse gas emission and increased carbon footprint via a few pathways which are via drugs, especially volatile agents, equipments, particularly single-use equipments, electricity usage, and operating theatre wastage. Anesthetic drugs, particularly volatile agents such as desflurane and sevoflurane, have a global warming potential of 2,540 and 140 respectively. Nitrous oxide, which is also used as a pain relief in the labour room in the form of antinox, has a global warming potential of 248 and it also has an ozone depletion potential. Worse, all these agents have a long lifetime in the atmosphere with nitrous being the longest. Next, the drug that can cause environmental hazard that we use in anesthesia is propofol. The Swedish Chemicals Agency classified drugs that can cause environmental hazard using PBT index system, an acronym for potential bioaccumulation toxicity. Propofol, our main induction agent, has the PBT index of 9, which is the highest amongst all anesthetic drugs. And unfortunately, propofol was found to account for 45% of drug wastage by volume in most operating data worldwide. Next, the single-use equipment that we utilize in anesthesia, such as endotracheal tube, supraglottic airway devices, and oxygen tubing are mainly made from plastic. Plastics, as we know, resist decomposition and biodegradation. Therefore, the life cycle of this plastic inflicts considerable harm to our environment and human health. They will perpetuate greenhouse gas emissions and pollute air, water and soil. Operating data also contributes to increased carbon footprint via our high usage of electricity. OT are significantly more energy intensive per square foot than the rest of the hospital. We need this electricity for stringent heating, ventilation and air conditioning and also when we extend our hours of lighting and patient monitoring devices. We also need electricity to handle our specialised air handling units. Operating data waste will be e elaborated further by our next speaker, Prof. Shireen. I would like to touch on the anesthetic gas wastage. Waste anesthetic gases are environmental pollutants that routinely are vented from operating suites straight into the atmosphere. To reduce this wastage, we should use low fresh gas flow, turn off these gases when they are not in use, and titrate the use of these gases accordingly with appropriate monitoring. So what can we do to save the world's climate from further damage? As a team member in a group of healthcare providers of various backgrounds, we should work together to accomplish a shared goal and be mindful of what we do as a team. From the World Organization, the World Federation Societies of Anesthesiologists released a global consensus statement on principle of environmentally sustainable anesthesia in the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference held in Glasgow. They noted the mission is to reduce the environmental impact of anesthesia and this must align with the three underlying fundamentals which are patient safety should not be compromised by sustainable anesthetic practice. Number two, unity. All countries, including high, middle and low-income countries, should support each other appropriately in delivering green health care. And finally, healthcare system should be mandated to reduce their contribution to global warming. The WFSA agreed on seven principles that any anesthesia provider in the world should strive to achieve in order to provide environmentally sustainable anesthesia. They are, we should minimize the environmental impact of our clinical practice. We should incorporate environmental sustainability principles within formal anesthesia education. 
Next, we should use environmentally preferable medications and equipment when clinically safe. And we should embed environmental sustainability principles within anesthesia research and quality improvement program. Then, we should minimize the overuse or wastage of medication, equipment, energy, and water in our practice. And we should lead environmental sustainable activity within our healthcare and organizations. Last but not least, we should collaborate with industry to improve environmental sustainability. Following this, anesthesiologists in Europe has come up with their declaration in June 2023. Glasgow Declaration showed the EU's resolute commitment in addressing climate change and taking proactive measures to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. So what have we done in Malaysia? The Malaysian Society of Anesthesiologists and the College of Anesthesiologists Malaysia launched the campaign of Green Anesthesia Now or Never on 6 of August 2023. We launched this during our recent annual scientific meeting. The aim of this is to create awareness and get the buy-in from all stakeholders that we in the fraternity are committed to do this together. We also sent a survey on the knowledge, attitude and practices amongst our anaesthetists on green anaesthesia in Malaysia. The objective of this survey was to assess the knowledge gap on environmental sustainability practice among anaesthetists, to assess the attitude of anaesthetists towards greener anaesthetic practice and to evaluate the current practices among the anaesthetists. 171 anesthesia providers responded to our survey. It is good to know that majority of them are aware of the environmentally sustainable practices in anesthesia. However, although majority of the anesthesia providers are committed to practice sustainable anesthesia, majority of them claims that they are only moderately aware on how to do so. The results of our survey also showed that the respondents who had received prior training on sustainable anesthesia practices have higher level of knowledge regarding sustainability and are more committed to practice them compared to those without training. To increase the knowledge on how to practice green anesthesia, we held this national webinar entitled Moving Towards Green Anesthesia Now or Never, emphasizing on how we can incorporate green anesthesia safely in our practice. And we stimulate interest to practice by having variety of activities on green anesthesia. We organize a video competition on how to practice green anesthesia among members and we provide in monetary um, prizes for them and we also help a beach clean up on uh, at Tanjong Aru Sabah when we had our National Anesthesia Day celebration there. Last but not least, we also have an educational booth to display and educate our members on green anesthesia during our National Anesthesia Day celebration on 16 October 2023. And finally, we obtained a buy-in from different level of stakeholders and we managed to get the leaders in our fraternity and Ministry of Health to prioritise this agenda. We had them to sign a sustainability in anesthesiology pledge recently and we got the Ministry to agree on looking at procuring, procuring equipment and drugs that is according to a mission to reduce carbon dioxide emission. We need to do this together in order to save the world's climate, as the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it for us. To be a green hospital, the senior leaders in the hospital should be empowered to approve capital investment and equipment purchases. They should be cognizant of the life cycle analysis of a product before buying one. 
we need representatives from crucial support services such as facilities, environmental services and procurement to manage operational framework for sustainability practice. In addition, we should have multidisciplinary clinical champions encompassing frontline healthcare providers, surgeons, anesthesiologists and nurses who are going to play the important role in facilitating communication, staff education and action plans between environmental services and various departments. To promote green anesthesia in our department, we have medication stewardship to reduce drug wastage in our daily practice. We also have launched a few campaigns, such as the campaign to be more mindful when ordering investigations for patient and opening syringes when administrating medication to our patient. We also support the 3R market held by the facility department every month in UMMC to properly segregate our clinical waste. Last but not least, we advocate our staff to play an important part in reducing global warming. Ladies and gentlemen, my esteemed colleagues, I've come to my last few slides. I'd just like to conclude that green culture starts from home. We can start by practicing a proper waste segregation and do composting with our waste. We can also utilize solar power for our daily electricity at home. With the amount of rain we have in Malaysia, we should also practice rainwater harvesting. Most importantly, we have to be mindful in whatever we do and use the 6R concept of reduce, recycle, reuse, refuse, rethink and research in our daily activities. As my take-home message, I'd like to end my talk with this quote from Howard Zinn, an American philosopher. We don't have to engage in grand heroic actions to participate in change. Small acts, when multiplied by millions of people, can transform the world. With that, I thank you and I'd like to share you with you the picture of the people behind the Green Anesthesia Campaign and Celebration in UMMC. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Prof. Ina, for a very comprehensive lecture. I know you're not around, but your presence is very much felt and your lecture has really sent a very strong message to all of us that we have to do something for planet Earth. I know you will have questions. At the present moment, I don't see any, but we are going to take all the questions together once Prof. Shireen has done her share of the presentation. And if there are any questions that's addressed currently to Prof. Ina, I will take the questions for you simply because I'm also a vac uh, an advocate for green anesthesia, being an anesthesiologist myself. So I will now introduce you to Prof. Shireen, who is currently the head of the Division of Pediatric and Neonatal Surgery in the Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. And she's also the Vice President of the Malaysian Association of Pediatric Surgery, Council Member of the College of Surgeons, Academy of Medicine, and represents Malaysia in various international organizations, including the Board of the Asian Association of Pediatric Surgeons and the Publications Committee of the Pacific Association of Pediatric Surgeons. Shireen champions diversity and sustainability in surgery and hopes for a future that is fairer, cleaner, and healthier. So, um, Prof. Shireen, you may press ahead sharing your passionate topic. Thank you very much, Prof. Chan, for the introduction. And may I just record my congratulations also to my uh, long-term friend, Prof. Ina, for, uh, for her convocation ceremony today in obtaining her further Master's in Medical Education on top of her other qualifications. Um, so, I'll just share my screen. Um, <clears throat> right. Uh, Prof Chan, um, does it look all right on your end? It does. Perfect. Okay, great. So I will continue on the talk from green anesthesia to green surgery. Um, and Prof Ida mentioned just now that there is there are there is so much impact on the environment in terms of our huge just 
the, the fact that there's human life on this planet impacts the planet in so many ways. And we have looked already at the um, the, the climate action and um, the, a lot of the data on carbon emissions. And we've looked at pictures and news reports on, on, uh, on the impact of our activities on the planet. Uh, but I know also that looking at these pictures, um, there are people who respond perhaps with some skepticism, um, with uh, or, or perhaps with the attitude that, well, it's so bad already, there's nothing we can do. So I, I also want to actually point out a new way of looking at this, or a different way, not, not so much new, but perhaps a different way of looking at this issue, which is um, it, from the lens of creation care. How do we live in this world in a way that values the world and the planet that we have been given to care for for the short time that we are on this earth. Um, just to repeat again that uh, the reason we're talking about green anesthesia and green surgery today is that actually the operating theatre has a huge carbon footprint. Healthcare in itself contributes 4.9% to the world's carbon emissions and that's actually more than aviation which gets a lot more publicity which contributes uh, up to about 2.4% or shipping which, which contributes 1.7%. Um, and of healthcare, the operating theatres are the most resource-intensive areas of the hospital. So where is our sphere of influence as surgeons and anaesthetists? And that is obviously the operating theatre. And um, I wanted to highlight some work that has been done by our very energetic and dynamic medical students who uh, completed a couple of research projects in the operating theatre on this topic of green surgery. And they looked at the areas of waste disposal water waste. They looked at uh, the life cycle mentioned by Prof, uh, Prof Ina just now on the operating theatre items that we use. And then we also looked at the issue of surgical trade rationalisation. So I'm going to talk about all these in my talk today. Starting, of course, with waste disposal. Um, the operating theatres generate about 20 to 33 percent of total hospital waste. Yeah, and that's a picture of our General Waste Collection Centre in PPUM. And I, I want to commend my medical students because they actually tracked where all the waste went from the operating theatre out to and, uh, and out of the hospital. Yeah. And uh, UMMC produces about 70,000 kilograms of waste annually. And uh, one of our accounting audits showed that even in three months, they had exceeded the year's cap or the year's intended limit. Right. Um, UMMC is also the second highest producer of hospital waste in Malaysia after Hospital Kuala Lumpur. Of course, that's unsurprising because we are the second largest hospital in Malaysia after HKL. Uh, if we focus a little bit more on waste segregation in OT, our students looked at how much waste was disposed incorrectly in OT. They observed 20 operations over a three-week period. And what they found was that... Um, in terms of waste thrown into general bins, right? So those blue bins that we see in the operating theatre, non-general items comprise 2% of those thrown into the general bin. Okay, so far so good. 2% is not bad, not great. No, it, I, I deal it down to zero, but that, that's not too bad. The interesting thing is, conversely, if you looked at the clinical bins, so our clinical waste bins, they're yellow in colour, 40% of the items thrown into our clinical bins were actually non-clinical items. So what does this mean? It is more expensive to process clinical waste. Um, clinical waste is processed by weight. So you pay for processing of this clinical waste by weight, right? So um, imagine 40% of the waste that's in the clinical bin is processed as clinical waste, which is a huge waste of already very limited resources that we have. And interestingly, also, in the sharp spin, 20% of the items thrown into the sharp spin were actually non-sharp items. Okay, and then I'll go into a bit more detail with, with this, right? So, um, 20 to 29%, depending on which theatres they were looking at. And it was the most wrongly disposed category. And the main observation, really, is that many syringes with no needles were thrown into the sharp spin. And many non-sharp items, such as clean gauze, that were used to help push down items into a sharps container. And that resulted in that item ending up in the sharps bin, even though, obviously, things like gauze and cotton wool are not sharps items, right? And again, it's back to the issue of a waste of resources and money. 
very short in a very short supply now because how we process sharps is very different from how we process non sharps right so this was um this was just looking at waste disposal patterns in our operating theaters in UMMC right then we also looked at water waste and what did our what did my students do uh, they measured water that was left running but was unused during our scrubbing, uh, 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 du during the times that uh, the, the scrub team scrubbed into theatre, all right? And uh, this, of course, was a proxy measurement because uh, so, so we estimated it in time and seconds times the estimated flow, right? And uh, they looked at the average water used during scrub. So basically, if your, water, if your hands are under the water, it's used water, and if your hands are out, of water flow, it's called uh, that. That water running at that time is considered wasted water, right? So that, um, you can see that scrub nurses, of course, very compliant to protocols. They use a lot more water because uh, they 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 uh, were more compliant to our scrubbing protocols. And surgeons slightly less water because surgeons are tend to be a little bit impatient and want to get to the surgery quickly. And you can see that there's a total amount of water actually is about two thirds of the total amount of water wasted during the scrub cycle is actually about two thirds of the total water used. Right, so we identified we we um we observed ten scrub nurses, and you can see that if you look at the mean and the median of the total scrubbing duration, total amount of water wasted, and the total amount of water truly used, we end up with actually the percentage of water wasted at about sixty seven percent, which is about two thirds of the scrubbing cycle. Right, that's 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 a lot of water. Now this pattern is also seen in surgeons so they observed 20 surgeons and you can also see that in terms of the percentage of water wasted about two-thirds of the water running is actually never used to actually wash our hands yeah so so you can imagine also that if you multiply that by multiple teams per day operating over multiple lists in multiple areas over our very large and very busy hospital. And you can see that there's a huge amount of water that wasted. And this water is actually not not collected to be reused. It just runs away. Yeah? Okay, so among the actions that we could consider is actually could we consider motion sensor taps? Again, that's also uh, that also consumes resources. They have to ma be maintained. Um, but there is also this concept of a waterless scrub in which we use the alcohol hand rubs as our scrub cycle instead of using water and soap. That's something that is um, fairly recent but has been adopted in many recognized centers over the world, including high-income countries in North America and in Europe. And that may also be the way forward in terms of reducing water wastage. Um, then we looked at the sustainability profile of our operating theatre items. And this, uh, if you can recall, Prof. Ina mentioned this just now in her presentation on looking at the life cycle, the life cycle of the items that we use. So what did we do? We looked at all discarded items that were used in our operating theatres, right? And we assessed them according to these categories. Were they reusable? Were they recyclable? Or were they biodegradable, right? So we're looking at items that we use once and then discard, right? <clears throat> so recyclable items included paper, glass, and plastics. And we categorize plastics according to the International uh, Res Resin Identification Coding System, the RIC. And you can see on the left here, we have many um, uh, instrument wraps that are actually half paper, half plastic packaging. And this is what we call the type one type of plastic. Irrigation solution bottles, and that's type two. Oxygen masks, oxygen tubing, suction tubing, that's PVC type three. Um, intravenous fluid bottles, that's type four, low density polyethylene. And um, there are various things like our air warming blankets, which we use a lot of in our pediatric uh, OT, um, and blue wraps, etc. <clears throat> that's type five. Okay. I did want to point out that um, this symbol. Many people mistake this symbol as indicating that the item is recyclable, okay? But actually, it doesn't mean that at all. This triangle with these arrows are actually only to tell you the type of plastics that are being used in that item, yeah? They actually don't indicate that the plastic is recyclable, all right? And this is something this is something fairly recent that I, that I discovered myself. Now, what does this mean, all right? So what is the lifespan of these various plastics that we use in theatre? And remember, we are using once and then discarding them, right? So if you look on the left, half paper, half plastic instrument wraps, that's a life cycle of about five to 10 years, yeah? Irrigation solution bottles, 100 years, right? Um, we do have a recycling process. So in fact, UMMC recycles 
all the bottles, all these irrigation solution bottles, right? Which is a great initiative. Look at oxygen mask tubing and suction tubings. They're made of PVC and basically PVC never disappears, right? It never disappears. IV fluid bottles, they last about 500, 1,000 years. And in terms of the blue wrap force air warming blankets, that's about 20 to 30 years. So you can imagine that they last a very, very long time in our environment. What about gowns and drapes? So in UMMC, we use gowns and drapes that are single use and they are made of non-recyclable, non-woven fabric. Now, there is a benefit to patient safety in this matter because they are waterproof, right? And um, because, they're seeing, uh, because they're waterproof, there is a reduced risk of surgical site infections. But actually, there are reusable materials now that are waterproof and that are available in the market. Um, but because there isn't a pressure to purchase, they are not available in our hospital, right? So they're made of wo either woven poly polyester, waterproof cotton, etc. And a, a lot of research has gone into this topic in how we can make reusable materials waterproof. So what are biodegradable options? Plastic pa packaging, surgical gowns, gloves, and masks, there are actually also biodegradable options. But in our institution, as well as actually, I, I dare say, many or perhaps all other institutions in the Ministry of Health and perhaps in our private hospitals as well, we rely on actually non-biodegradable items. And, you, and if you look at all these items, plastic packaging, surgical gowns, gloves, masks, these are every case, every theatre, these are used multiple times across multiple lists, across multiple sites in the hospital. So our conclusion in, for this area of our research was that there is certainly scope for change to more environmentally friendly materials. And we certainly want to support further research in the impact of sustainability measures on patient safety, right? Um, I, I wanted to remind the audience also that if you're looking at the five R's or six R's actually mentioned by Prof. Hina just now, her six R was, was research, my six R here is rot or compost, right? But really, recycling is at the bottom of this pyramid because recycle, if, if you think about recycling, very few items are recycled especially clinical waste is not recycled, it is disposed of um, uh, using very clear processes. And only 10% or even less than 10% of recyclable items in Malaysia overall are even recycled, which means the 90% of recyclable items just go into landfill or are disposed of, right? So really we want to think about how do we refuse using those items in the first place or rethink or reduce whether we need to use them in the first place, right? So um, this is the this is the uh, six R pyramid, and um, my uh, and and I also want to talk about surgical tray rationalization, which is uh, a concept in which there is a systematic reduction in the number of surgical instruments used during a case in theatre, right? To perform specific procedures without compromising patient safety while reducing losses in the sterilization and assembly of trays. And um, for non-surgeons who might be listening to this, basically we have a tray, right, a surgical tray full of instruments that we use during theatre. And what surgeons often uh, encounter is that many of the items, in terms of the organization and packing of the items, we actually never use them during the surgery. Right now, this uh, this is because uh, it's, it's about streamlining of processes, and you you want to minimize um, multiple different types of packages. So they try to streamline um, packaging in terms of the the types of uh, instruments they're put in. But it ends up while while it helps in terms of streamlining processes and reducing the number of uh, permutations that the sterilization department has to, has, has to contend with, it really results in actually sterilization of many, many unused instruments. And this wastes energy, time, and costs. And so what this aspect of our project looked at was how many instruments remain unused at the end of a procedure. Okay, so we uh, this was piloted in the pediatric surgery and our neurosurgery OTs, uh, looking at twenty two core pediatric surgery procedures and nine core neurosurgery procedures. When we say core procedures, basically these are very these procedures are commonly done. They are very uh, they are core procedures, and uh, which means that they are considered fairly uh, simple, not complex, not complicated, right? And what they what our students did was they observed all the procedures and they labeled and compared the before and after pictures of surgical trays and tools. And they identified items that were never asked for, 
that were never used during that particular surgical procedure, and they noted supplementary items and sets and noticed and noted missing items. Okay. For pediatric surgery, um, I've selected. Uh, we we have data for all those procedures that that they that the so that the students reviewed, but I want to look at circumcision because it's really the such a very 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 common procedure, right? And if when we removed items that were never used, we found that we could reduce the median number of items used at, at, from about fifty five percent to a quarter, so from half to a quarter, and the range for, from from forty two to sixty four percent down to even 14 to 41 percent and if you and, and for surgeons out there if you look at some of these items that are packed for circumcisions you can imagine that why would we ever require a Langenberg retractor for circumcision why would we ever require a corpus artery for, for circumcision right? looking at neurosurgery um uh, just uh, just um uh, extracting data on craniotomy which is also a very very common neurosurgical procedure these were the list of never used items and if we remove the never used items, you could also bring down from nearly half to, that's an even better outcome here, which is from 44% to 17%, and a range from, the, from a lower minimum of 35% to 6%. So really removing these items does make a lot of difference, right? So these are across the various uh, procedures in pediatric surgery. And you can you look at the blue on the left is before removal of never used items. And you look at the red, that's after removal of never used items. And you can see that the number of items really drops to about half across the procedures. What's the impact of tray rationalization? It reduces energy waste in sterilizing instruments that are not used. And very importantly, it reduces wear and tear of instruments because that's also one constant gripe that surgeons have. Why don't our instruments work properly? They don't clip properly, they, they, they slip. They are loose, um, and then and then we get upset at instruments. And this is one way actually to reduce wear and tear of instruments. So um, if there are people out there that are already concerned about this, the good news is that you're not alone. A few of us here are certainly very passionate about this aspect. But also, our students did a survey on our healthcare workers in the operating theatres. And this was uh, presented at our Pediatric Surgical Conference in 2022. And this has been published in uh, a Q3 journal, Pediatric Surgery International. So they um, they interviewed 76 physicians, 45 non-physician healthcare workers. So basically our nurses, uh, attendants, et cetera. And they interviewed 28 medical students. Most respondents have good sustainability awareness. So that's very good. Yeah. Um, and very heartening to note is actually attitude towards sustainability improves with the years of medical experience. So the more senior we are, the, the more aware actually, and the more willing we are to adopt these measures. And this is also actually reflected in Prof Ina's survey of anesthetists. The difference was not significant, but I looked, but I noticed that in her data, anesthetists with 10 years, more than 10 years of experience, had actually higher knowledge, higher awareness, and higher willingness to adopt measures compared to those less with less than 10 years of experience, even though the difference was not significant. It trended higher. And this is reflected. With, so I, I saw this pattern as well in our research project. Um, um, there is a perception of OT staff towards proposed changes, right? Um, we asked about their attitudes towards reusable, reusable gowns, re reusable head caps, are called hand washing, hand scrubs, etc. Various aspects, right? Reusable instruments, lap laparoscopic ports, instrument casings, right? What we did notice were, is, was also interesting is that um, the, the, there was most resistance to alcohol hand washing so right so so waterless drug so this is probably something that we need to look at in terms of what evidence is out there and what literature literature can be used to convince surgeons and ot staff but of course never compromising patient safety so where do we start in the operating theater of course, low lay low lying food is correct waste disposal that's such an easy thing to do because really it's about emphasizing awareness it is an uh, is it the earliest measure we can take with the greatest cost saving impact? Okay, um, it, it it's very simple measures like making sure that the clinical waste bins are available in the right area, but also that general waste bins are available, so that we're not throwing general waste into clinical waste bins because that wastes our resources. Surgical tray rationalization is also a very easy one to do. We don't have to do it for very complex, complicated cases in which we have a vast array of uh, necessary instruments, but we can start with our basic 
core procedures. And every every surgical specialty has those basic core, uh, core procedures where we can afford to to um, have some surgical tray rationalization. Um, an interesting thing that we noted also when we did that project was that our catheter, our urinary catheter insertion instrument had a 100% utilization uh, rate for, all, for, for everything that was packed in that set. And uh, having a green culture in which we, we don't use, we, we reduce suture wastage, right? We don't just use one suture, throw it away, use another suture, throw it away. Basic measures, switching off lights when not in use. So if the toilet, if we're not using the toilet, switch off the toilet light. We're not using our on-call room, switch off the, the lights in the on-call room. And using water dispensers instead of bottled water. That's also very simple. We have a water dispenser in our operating theatre, but we, go, we can actually very simply just bring a bottle of water, right? Uh, our own reusable bottle of water, rather than using single-use plastic water bottles. And then, of course, we want to climb a little bit higher, right? So that, that those are basic measures. But what's next? We want to look at the safety profile of waterless theatres using alcohol hand wrap, right? We, um, can we explore switching to reusables? reusable drapes, scrubs, laparoscopic instruments, switching to biodegradables, such as gloves, right, uh, uh, masks, etc. This, of course, goes back to our procurement process and a decision-making process at a much higher level. And um, perhaps pressure on device R&D as well. So one example of that is that um, I, I often have device representatives and social representatives coming to see me uh, to talk about their... Uh, what, what they have to, uh, on offer. And um, I've noticed that there is a move towards redesigning instruments so that they become non-reusable. And I really think that this is, this is really not the way to go at all, right? So a, a very expensive, very high spec instrument is, is redesigned so that it becomes non-reusable. That's, that's, that's really not the way that we should be going. Um, so a reminder to our audience actually to try to look at the world with a green lens, um, think about our impact on the environment in a practical way. I'm not saying that everyone walks to work or cycles to work, really, that's not very practical in, in the world that we live in. But really, what difference can we make in the decisions and the, the culture that we want to encourage in our workplace? Uh, this is just an example. So, for example, uh, uh, what, what I try to do is, for example, um, if I am uh, organizing a conference or a workshop, etc., I try to emphasize to our organizers or committees that can we go as green as possible, right? So can we reduce the use of uh, single-use plastic consumables, for example? Or if uh, a rep wants to give us a little bit of a breakfast, I will say, okay, you know, could we put it, uh, rather than in those single-use plastic bento boxes, which are so common nowadays, can we move to something that's a little bit more environmentally friendly? And that's the, those are the little things that we can do at our level. So I really want to acknowledge the work of the very dynamic and uh, hardworking medical students, student groups last year and this year, and my uh, colleagues as well, uh, Prof. Arabin and Prof. Anand, who, who also co-supervise these students, my colleagues in the Division of Pediatric Surgery, Department of Surgery and Dean's Office, uh, Faculty of Medicine, who are very supportive of these projects that we're doing, and of course the OT subcommittee and the management of EMMC, where all these projects were done, who have also been very supportive. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Shireen, for your very comprehensive lecture as well. We are now opening the uh, platform to questions from the floor. There were a number of questions about trying to uh, put the initiative, that means going green, all over the hospital. I believe that's a very good move. Prof. Azura, who is representing Prof. Nazira, she's the assistant director, and uh, she says they are going to start the ball rolling and making sure that the um, environment will be our concern. Since we contribute about 5%, the hospital contributes about 5% to um, this, this uh, particular crisis that is in our hands. And uh, as I said, if you have got any questions for both the lecture, can you please uh, put it in the uh, question and answer uh, part of the uh, platform. And um, maybe I can ask uh, Prof. Shireen, what is the barrier, since you've raised the question that there's a lot of um, biodegradable products in surgery itself, what exactly is the barrier against 
the use of biodegradable products then? Uh, thanks, thank you for the question, Prof Chan. So um, there are actually, for example, yeah, um, there are uh, our glove providers actually. Um, our very large local glove producer in Malaysia, which is among I, among one of the largest in the world, if I'm not mistaken, they have a biodegradable alternative. But if you uh, if you notice when the reps come and talk to us about it, they don't actually talk to us about the biodegradable alternative. But if you go on their website, it's available, right? Um, so so that, that's a great question. I mean, where where is that push coming from? And I think we actually effectively are and are the end users. Of course, our patients are end users, right? Like we provide the services. But actually, in terms of ordering um, consumables, using consumables, we are the end users. So actually, it's, it's back to my uh, one of my last slides is we need to actually know where we stand in how we can influence the process and actually push the pressure back the other way. When they come for procurement, when they come for tender, we should include in our specifications, do you have a biodegradable alternative? What's your sustainable alternative? What are sustainability measures? Do you, for instance, collect back the suture packaging, right? So um, uh, I know J&J &J has, an, has uh, a, an initiative in Australia where they collect back suture packaging for recycling. But we don't do that here. Why not? If it can be done in Australia, why can't it be done here, right? And I think that requires a pressure from us as well as the end users, for those of us who care about this. That's a very good answer, but I have my own version as well. See, sure. <laughs> most, of the, most of the companies live on profit. Profit ah. is their philosophy. Whereas for us, in fact, I believe all of us in all our activities should feel that everything that we use should be charged not to a company, not to our University Malaya budget or whatever, but charged to planet Earth. <laughs> everything must be charged to planet Earth. And we need an accountant from planet Earth. Not sure who the accountant will be. Maybe all of us can volunteer to be that accountant. So most biodegradable products are expensive. I think it can be as high as two to three times what exactly you pay for your normal product. It's just like uh, organic vegetables. They are two to three times more expensive because of the different energy that you put in. So un un unfortunately, if you want to have a, a, a more pleasant world to live in, you must actually tell them that you're happy to pay for that. And instead of them, you know, they, they also have their CSR or activities that they feel they have to plow back. You know, the companies have to plow back in order to benefit the community. That amount that they spend is actually very, very little. In fact, yeah. some people put it as 1% of their profit. It is just a token to please you, to tell you, I'm doing good, you know, but uh, 20, I'm sorry, 99%, yeah. 99% of the profit actually goes into their own pockets and then they make the world a worse place because they'll be flying here from the benefits or, you know, their directors will be doing lots and lots of things to further degrade the world. In fact, I know the two uh, speakers have given a very comprehensive um, lecture individually but i want to actually for those of you who are not uh, shall we say advocates for planetary health they have actually mentioned about global warming and how it comes about through carbon dioxide and i want to put that missing link for all of you so that you can understand what it's all about pre-industrial period our carbon dioxide level was only 300. Currently, it's about 400 parts per million. Now, what does carbon dioxide have to do with all this? Carbon dioxide is a gas that actually shields the planet Earth and allows the planet Earth to warm up with sunshine. Now, planet Earth is about 93 million miles. I learned this when I was very, very young. Million miles from the sun. So by right, we shouldn't feel warm at all. But because of the infrared rays from the sun being trapped inside this, um, shall we say, the carbon dioxide frame, they cannot escape once they hit the planet Earth. This is how the greenhouse 
uh, works as well in the colder countries where they use glass to allow the infrared sunshine to come in of whatever they see during winter. They trap the heat inside and then they are able to grow the greenhouse um, plants that you call, you know, over winter. So similarly, the carbon dioxide levels in planet Earth are actually trapping a lot. And being now 400 parts per million, they trap more heat. That's why the global temperature has actually gone up. Now, the energy that we actually use most of the time is, of course, produced by renewable or non-renewable renewable sources. The non-renewable sources like oil converts to carbon dioxide. Now, besides carbon dioxide, there are other gases like our famous nitrous oxide. Of course, in anesthesia, nitrous oxide is used and we have now seen, we are now seeing a slow shift away from the use of nitrous oxide because nitrous oxide, as was pointed out by Prof. Ina, has a global warming potential of very long duration, more than a hundred years. It stays up there in that atmosphere and does exactly what carbon dioxide does, trap the heat and won't allow the heat to go away. Similarly, all the ways that Prof. Shereen mentions, when they decompose eventually, becomes methane. Methane is also another one of those carbon dioxide equivalent gas. So that particular list where Prof. Ina mentions all the anesthetic agents, a lot of them do what carbon dioxide does. In fact, even many times worse. So what we are actually trying to tell everybody to do is to try to reduce the production of these um, gases as well. Now, nitrous oxide, although anesthesiologists have actually moved away from this, nitrous oxide is also produced in the production of fertilizers for our plants. Those, those artificial fertilizers that you buy from the market shelf, they are responsible for almost 95% of the nitrous oxide. And of course, you have combustion, all producing carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, all these gases actually trap the heat. Now, currently, there are actually uh, research going on that will allow carbon dioxide to, they are thinking of disposing carbon dioxide, not shooting it out into the um, outer space, but trying to make them solids and then settling them right into the ocean to reduce that 400 parts per million that I was talking about. So you can see there's a lot of research going on, but we are not keeping up with the production. So what Prof. Shireen and Prof. Ina are doing, they are doing small parts. But as um, this particular philosopher, what's his name? Howard was saying, every small act, when you actually have millions and millions of contributors to that small act in reducing what we have just mentioned can contribute to a better world. And you can see these two advocates have really brought our focus into this very sharply. I've seen praises for them and I'm very sure you can do your share as well. Drive less. If you can walk, do the walking and Remember to switch off the lights as well. Do your share because we can't tell you the number of things you can actually do. And it's a, it's a whole new vista altogether. And I'm sure you can con connect with all of us. And once uh, Prof Azura starts the committee, I have just volunteered myself. You can come for more information as well. And we will help you in the correct direction. I have been in this path for the last 15 years or so now uh, because we know that we can do our share. In fact, I'm a very avid gardener. I advocate for the production of oxygen, the assimilation of carbon dioxide into my plants, organic food being the way out if you're going to reduce the stress on the um, hospital system. And I'm sure you can do your share in so many ways. Prof, there are a lot of questions actually, so maybe uh, we, we'll try to answer them. Uh, um, yeah. I, I think Prof Azura asked for for, uh, for a list of institutions that are already using waterless scrub. Um, I've, I've given a link uh, to an, a New England journal 
video actually on uh, waterless hand scrub, um, but there are also RCTs, meta-analysis, uh, etc. Um, from high-income countries that have moved towards this, uh, demonstrating no difference in surgical site infections. So I will send that also to Prof. Azura. Um, I think uh, Dr. Ng Kisiong from uh, Medical Department is doing work with Orang Asli. Actually, we're getting a lot of uh, very encouraging uh, messages saying that uh, I think there are many people who are interested in this and it's about collaborating and coordinating all our efforts. Uh, Prof. Chris Boy, thank you very much. Uh, have we looked at increasing such education and undergraduate curriculum? That is actually really something that I would love to be able to see in our undergraduate curriculum. And it, it, it has already started in some undergraduate curriculums as well. I know, for instance, the Netherlands, they've already incorporated it into the undergraduate medical curriculum. Uh, Puan Salawati is our matron uh, in the OT subcom. She's already started, uh, she's starting a pilot project on surgical tray rationalization. So hopefully we can demonstrate that there's a real difference in terms of uh, in the improvement of our surgical tray instrument utilization. Yeah. Uh, what else? Uh, um, Hope that we have, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm glad to see a lot of interest. Actually, we this is really something we should be looking at. If if at at, at even at very base level, it will save costs. A lot of these measures can save costs, which is something that is resources, financial resources are in such short short supply. Beautiful. In fact, actually, this particular lectures are also projected to the University of Malaya uh, campsite as well. If you've heard the lecture, do understand that it's recorded. Share it with your friends the link. If not, come back to the University uh, Faculty of Medicine and we are happy to share this link with you. And then we can work together as a university, if not a country. Malaysia Bole, right? Yes. Very good. I'm very sure we can, just like what our Prime Minister did with the, uh, uh, the, the war in Gaza, we can also do something useful. In fact, I'm wondering if we are contributing to the discussion tomorrow that starts tomorrow in Dubai, where they're going to have a COP28 discussing about uh, climate change. All right. Um, I hope that something uh, positive comes out from that discussion because every time um, where this meeting is concerned, promises are made, but nobody does anything to prevent further worsening of the uh, health of the planet Earth. So this is uh, very timely, you would agree, Prof. Shireen, that uh, we actually have this awareness uh, presentation and I'm very sure you can increase the consciousness, every one of you. In fact, we are pleading that every one of you come on board to help us increase the consciousness on this subject, planetary Earth, where your children and all the future generations can benefit from a better world. We can't let Greta Thunderbird do the work. We have lots of greeters around, Prof. Shireen being one of them. I'm also one of them, <laughs> although I'm very old. And um, we still have Prof. Ina as well. And all the young people just come on board and celebrate planet Earth the way it is to be appreciated. With that, I would like to thank all of you for attending. And we're just making one plea, spread the word. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you.